Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to this more to this evening's Evelyn Wrench talk with James Barr, who will give us some fascinating stories from his book Lords of the Desert, which describes Britain's struggle with America to dominate the Middle East. James is a leading historian of the modern Middle East and author of the widely acclaimed A Line in the Sand as well as Lord of the Desert. He is now working on a history of conflict in the Middle East, the arena. James read modern history at Oxford. He has worked in politics at the Daily Telegraph in the city at the British Embassy in Paris and has run his own research business. He is a visiting fellow at King's College London and he lives in South London with his wife and two children. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in using the Q&A function uh, be, and you can start doing it as soon as the questions come to mind. Don't, don't wait for us to finish. Um, so welcome everyone and uh, lovely to see you, James. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Eve. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for joining me in South London. It feels slightly funny that, that uh, when uh, you first came up with this, the idea for this talk, we were talking about me coming to the um, the, the RS, uh, RSL in, in, in St. James's and uh, talking about uh, how we would do this over dinner. And it's now a rather different experience, but at least with the Zoom, we can, um, I can, we can, you can watch it from wherever you are. So wherever you are, good, good evening or good hello, whatever time of day it is. And uh, I hope you find this interesting. And talking of dinner, um, I want to take you, I want you to imagine that you are at a dinner tonight, if, if you're not actually eating. Uh, and it's the 10th of November 1942, and you have come to the Mansion House in the City of London, just opposite the Bank of England, uh, to hear a very important speech. And the, the speaker is uh, Winston Churchill, the then Prime Minister. He's flanked on each side by the the Lord Mayors of London, the outgoing one and the incoming one, and it's a, a, set, a set piece speech that, that Prime Minister makes every year. Uh, but this year he has some particularly good news. After a year of awful news, suddenly he has good news to report. And I shall now try and share my screen because the, the, uh, the speech was reported well the following day. Now, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, Oops, share. So uh, this is the Times the following day. And you might be thinking, well, what was this speech? And, and you do know it because um, in it, uh, Churchill said something very, very famous. And I'll see if I can just, oh, how do I go on? Oh dear. That's it. Um, very famous quote, a bit of chiasmus. Now, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And uh, the Times tells us that this was greeted with loud cheers. Now that was the good news in the speech, but the rest of the speech is, is also interesting. The second half of it deals not with the, the, the victory in the desert that had just happened, but, but starts to think on about the future and in particular about the, the future relationship between Britain and the United States. Because of course, as Britain attacked Rommel in the desert at the other end of uh, North Africa, the Americans had landed um, on, the, on the Northwest African coast. And, and because of that, there was now this question of how these two allies would interact. And, and the tone that Churchill uh, takes on as the speech goes on is quite interesting. Uh, we, we covet no French possession. We have no acquis acquisitive appetite or ambitions. We've not entered this war for profit or expansion. We desire no territorial gains and no commercial favors. And it culminates uh, with this also famous quote, um, but you might not have appreciated that it comes in this particular speech, that we mean to hold our own. I have not become the King's first minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British empire. Loud cheers again. Now, who was this aimed at? Who was who was he? Who did he have in mind? And uh, people tend to think that this was aimed at the at the uh, American president, FDR, Fred, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. 
uh, because those two men, of course, had signed a treaty off Newfoundland a year earlier, and the Atlantic Charter in that Britain had agreed uh, to two things that sound today rather innocuous, but at the time were, were very significant concessions. One of them was self-determination uh, in the future, and the other one was free trade. And these both uh, hit at you know, weak points in, in sort of British imperial strategy. Uh, of course, self-determination cuts cut very much against um, what the empire was doing, but also free trade because the, the British empire uh, worked as a sort of closed economic system and the Americans were desperate to break into that. So, so with that, uh, with that, with that, uh, that charter, Roosevelt had achieved something quite significant, but now Churchill appears to be rolling back on it. But the man that Churchill had particularly in mind wasn't Roosevelt, it was somebody else who just said something. And it was this man you see here on, on the left of your screen wearing the pith helmet, a man called Wendell Wilkie. Now he's somebody who's largely been forgotten, but in 1942, he was very famous because he had stood against FDR in the 1940 election. And although he'd, he'd lost by a mile, he was a very popular man and he, he enjoyed great goodwill for someone who, who'd come second. He got 22 million votes uh, uh, in that election. And he had just, just before Churchill's Mansion House speech, made a radio broadcast in the United States, which had attracted 36 million listeners. And in it, he described the trip that he had just made around the world, which he then also wrote a book about. And this trip had taken him through a lot of areas that were controlled by the British. And the radio broadcast amounted, without actually mentioning Britain, it amounted to a pretty full on, full frontal attack on British imperialism, because Wilkie had gone around the world and the more he saw, the less impressed he was. So he got home and he launched his attack. And it was that at the mansion house that, uh, that um, Churchill was responding to. Hopefully you can now see a big map. I bought this map at a junk shop in Crystal Palace in South London. I'm very proud of it, but it's so big I can't actually put it up. So I have to constrain myself to showing people pictures of it on a screen. Um, and it was published uh, uh, by the West German firm Jörg Westermann in, in 1968. So you can see that it's sort of slightly out of date, but it, it's good for, for the purposes of this talk and, and, and for giving you an idea of the area. Uh, now, can I also hopefully get a, let me just see if I can get my laser pointer. Good, okay, I'm gonna start over in the, the West because, so Wilkie arrived in Cairo in 1942 in the, with the preparations for the El Alamein battle sort of uh, happening. And then he then flew uh, east up through Lebanon. He went to Beirut, um, he went to Jerusalem and then he flew to Baghdad and then through Tehran and then east. He wasn't allowed into India. The British wouldn't allow him in there. And he ended up going via China and, and round to, uh, to the west coast of America. And he did all this in, a, in an American bomber. And um, what he saw was the sort of the extent of, of British control over that part of the world, because the British had been in, in Egypt since 1882. Uh, they had acquired the mandate, uh, the, the League of Nations mandate to govern pa Palestine in 1920. Uh, they had set up the kingdoms of Jordan and Iraq themselves. They were both run by the Hashemites who'd helped Lawrence of Arabia in the First World War. And they were now jointly in a, in a rather awkward marriage occupying Lebanon and Syria with France, having booted out the, the, the Vichy government and, and taken over its, its, um, most of its officials uh, in 1941. Then in Iran, they were in a condominium with the, the Russians now. Since 1941, again, they had split the country and, and the British were there. So Wilkie passed through this territory and he could see an area where the, Britain was very much the top dog. But British officials didn't really seem to have appreciated what the Atlantic Charter was going to mean in the future. And that was the point of, of Wilkie's attack in 1942. Now, during the war, what Britain came up with, they, Britain knew that it was deeply in debt and it knew that after the war, it would need to try and export its way out of trouble. So British officials during the war came up with the idea of trying to group all these states or a good number of them together into effectively a, something a bit like the European Union. It was gonna be an economic union uh, which used sterling as its currency. And because it did that, the British would be able to export 
goods to them and Britain would turn its manufacturing output away from making stuff for the war and, and uh, it would start to get itself out of the deep debt that it had gone into with the United States. Uh, but the Americans had other ideas because they saw these these places as markets for them as well, and they didn't want the British um, uh, running all of it. Uh, and so they uh, sent in. If I can just, I'm going to be able to. Ah, oh, just this gives me a chance just to show the one of the stranger pictures from the book. But this is the king of Iraq on the the on the left wearing his army uniform. Uh, together with the regent, his uncle, who uh, slightly fits the wicked uncle stereotype, Abdullah, uh, who was uh, both of them in the end, uh, but Abdullah had already been educated at Harrow and Faisal would be in due course too. And these were the kind of people that the British exercised a good deal of influence through in, in that part of the world. Back to the map. Uh, but the Americans then got involved because they could see what was going on. And they sent this man, James Landis, who had been a trust buster in 1930s America. He'd worked for FDR and he was then sent to the Middle East to put a spanner in the works of the British plan. And he did that very, very successfully. And in fact, uh, one of the people who worked for him uh, said that he insisted on regarding the British rather than the Germans as his principal enemy. Uh, and so as a result of that, this great British plan to try and create a, effectively a captive market in the Middle East failed. And by the end of the war, it was in tatters. And, and the Americans who had really occupied, had had very, very little influence in that part of the world compared to the British. Uh, it was re it really restricted to uh, missionary activity, some archaeologists, and then in the 30s and in the late 30s, a handful of um, oil men. Uh, but the American influence started to grow as Americans, the Americans started to export into, particularly in industrial machinery, into these markets. Uh, and, and Britain suddenly found itself in, in serious competition. What I'm going to do tonight is talk a bit about this early process, because I think uh, we tend to see 1956 as the great turning point in uh, the British-American relationship in the Middle East because of the Suez crisis that happened that year. Uh, but I would argue that this turning point happened much, much earlier and that Suez, in a sense, is uh, the reason it matters is, is it's because it, it only happened because Britain was already powerless. It happened because Britain not only was already powerless, but it knew it was powerless and it, it lashed out as a result of that. And so to understand how it lost its power, we need to look at this early post-war period and understand the sort of the shift in the balance of power that took place. The difficulty with tackling this subject is that actually a lot of it is still secret. And compared to the book I wrote before that, A Line in the Sand, where I found that most of the archives from the pre-1945 period are now all open, a lot of the archives relating to uh, British relations with America, particularly the more sensitive aspects, they're still closed. And even if you try and use freedom of information to get them open, it's, um, it's, a, it's not a very uh, um, successful process. And so you find yourself sort of looking around for other sources of information. And I did eventually get there. But one of the interesting things I found was actually that there are a number of accounts that tend to have been overlooked, which actually are hiding in plain sight, if you like. So uh, these two books are very, very interesting because they tell parts of this story of this rivalry between Britain and America, uh, but they do so in a very, very veiled way. Uh, but I found both of them very, very interesting. And I think actually they, in many ways, um, provided the meat for two of the most interesting chapters in the book. Uh, and they are Arabs Oil and History by Kermit Roosevelt, better, better known as Kim Roosevelt, and Wilfred Thesiger's Arabian Sands. And you probably know that book uh, very, very well. And, and many of you will have read it. Um, less likely to have read the one by Kim Roosevelt, but that, that's, that is a very interesting book too. And uh, as I said, both of these were very, very interesting and they form part of what I'm gonna talk about tonight. We'd originally, the idea of tonight's talk was that I was gonna give um, sort of two bits of talk, one be, sort of between each course of, of dinner. Uh, and so I thought I would try and talk about these two episodes and uh, as the sort of the main part of the talk. This is Kim Roosevelt. He uh, is a part of the great, the great family, but he's not directly um, related to FDR. He was a cousin, uh, but he was uh, the grandson of Teddy Roosevelt, who'd been the president at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, 
and uh, he, uh, in 1947, set out to the Middle East. So the book that he wrote, Arabs Oil and History, uh, is the is the product of this this trip. Now he was working, um, he had worked in the war for the uh, Office for Strategic Services, the, the sort of pre, um, precursor of the CIA. And by 1947, 1947 I think was the year when the CIA was created, but this is just before that. He was working for, a, um, I can't remember what it was called now, but the, the sort of interim organization before Truman uh, gave formal approval for the, the creation of the CIA. But he was pretending to be a, a magazine journalist on a, on a commission from Harper's Magazine. And he went out to Egypt in 1947. And the book is essentially a, a kind of survey of politics in the Middle East. But when you know, and of course, no one reading this book in 1949, when it first came out, would have known, or very, very few people would have known the, the real story about what he was actually doing. Uh, but when you read it now, you can sort of see that this is effectively a, uh, it's a sort of, um, what's the word, uh, a, a kind of fact-finding, a fishing expedition, looking for contacts for the CIA, looking for the kind of people who might be amenable to talk to the Americans. And they were very, very interested in people who had, uh, who had studied at the American University in Beirut, which was the biggest um, source of American influence in that part of the world, along with the, the American University in Cairo. And people, there were quite a lot of Arabs who had studied in the States. So you'll find him talking to the mayor of Aleppo, who it turned out had, had studied agriculture somewhere in the Midwest, I think, if I'm, I'm right in saying. So the book is this sort of uh, synthesis. But under that, hidden in there, there is a very, very interesting story about one particular episode, which I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, and it concerns this man. This is King Abdullah of Jordan. And after the war, the British put their hopes in him. So having seen their, their plan uh, to create the economic union fall apart because of American pressure, after the war, they started backing Abdullah, who had an idea of creating what he called the Greater Syria. Now, he's the King of Jordan, but he had great ambitions. He had an ambition to unite not just... Um, not just his cousin's kingdom in Iraq, but also Syria to the north, which was by then a republic. And the British backed him up and uh, British officials in the Foreign Office in London referred to him as Mr. Bevin's little king. Bevin was the foreign secretary at that time and Abdullah wasn't the tallest man in the Middle East. And, uh, and they, they threw their weight behind this scheme. Now, the Americans looked on at this with a sort of degree of suspicion because they had plans of their own and they feared that this British plan was going to upset their plan. Let's see if I can go forward. Now, bring back my laser pointer. The Americans, uh, their big, their big uh, economic interest in that part of the world at that time was the oil concession that they had, which, which uh, was drilling oil in this area in, in Eastern Saudi Arabia. But the thing they needed to do uh, to really turn it into something was to get oil to Europe, because at that point in time, the market for Saudi oil was largely going uh, eastwards. It was going it was going mostly to, to Asia. And that had been disrupted by the Second World War because uh, of the areas that had fallen into Jap under Japanese control. So the big effort, the big interest uh, the Americans had in 1947 when Roosevelt was pretending to be a magazine journalist in Cairo initially, was in trying to get the tap line set up. Now you can see this on the map, it's this black line running northwest up past the Iraqi border and then through Jordan, through a bit of Syria and finally to its terminus in the Lebanon. And the tap line was going to transform uh, the, the prospects of Saudi oil because it was going to pump it westwards and it was going to make it now competitive uh, with the product of the, the petroleum that was being produced by uh, Aramco's two big British rivals, Anglo-Iranian and the Iraq Petroleum Company, which despite its name wasn't really Iraqi at all. It was, it was British dominated and, and controlled, although there were American shareholders, but it was essentially a British concern. Uh, Aramco at that time was not uh, a state-owned Saudi oil company. It was a consortium, like a joint venture between four different American oil companies who uh, had managed to um, 
uh, change the, the structure of the company so they were able to get in investment so they could build the pipeline running up through here. But the Americans' big concern was that Britain's plans to back Abdullah in this area were going to uh, confound their project because what they could see was that clearly uh, anything that made Saudi oil cheaper compared to British produced oil, which the British were earning money on, uh, was going to was something that the British might not support. Now, in theory, the British were not supporting Abdullah. If they were asked in public, they would say, "Oh, we have no comment to make. We don't, you know, we neither support nor oppose this venture." Uh, but the Americans weren't convinced by that. And in 1947, the Secretary of State George Marshall decided that he would task everybody in the region with finding out what was actually happening. And Kim Roosevelt, uh, albeit as the, as the journalist in theory, was part of this much, much bigger effort. They were going to try and find out where, what the situation really was, what Britain really thought about this and, and the prospects of this scheme. And that is almost certainly what brought Roosevelt to Cairo. And it explains what happens because he then undertook a journey through the Middle East uh, not only looking for people who he, he could contact, but then he wanted to try and undermine this British scheme. And the place he went to, uh, first of all, was Amman. And it was there that he met this gentleman on the left, Sir Alec Kirkbride, who was Abdullah's sort of chief, um, chief advisor. He was the British ambassador. He had fought, a uh, fought alongside Lawrence of Arabia in the First World War. And he was now this sort of grand old man of British diplomacy in that part of the world. Well, Roosevelt, still pretending to be a journalist, went to see uh, went to see um, uh, Kirkbride, and I suppose must have played the fool somewhat. So uh, um, if I just stop sharing just half a second, so so they the two men that he went and got an interview uh, with uh, with Kirkbride, and I'll just see if I can find. The, just the description of it here, just a, a second. I'm going to manage to do that. Yes. So he went to see, he went to, Roosevelt also went to see uh, Abdullah, but he didn't get very far with him. Abdullah was a very clever man and he sat and, and uh, uh, in his fashion held Roosevelt by the shoulder and, and, and pretty much cuddled him, but he didn't give him any useful information. But Kirk Bride was rather taken in by, by Roosevelt's act and uh, uh, and he started to talk a bit, and Roosevelt must have realised that he was on the point of, uh, of striking gold. So he said, Abdullah is all right, he explained to Roosevelt, who was 20 years younger than him. He's a bit erratic, of course, but a sound fellow at heart. And these Arabs need a king, you know. And Roosevelt must have realised that he was on the, the verge of striking gold. Days earlier in London, the British had been asked exactly this question about, about whether they favoured greater Syria, and they'd said that they were strictly neutral. Uh, but Kirkbride then completely contradicts this. He said, this idea of separate Syrian and Lebanese republics, that's a lot of nonsense. This all used to be one country, Syria, Lebanon, Trans, Jordan, and what we call Palestine too. It was all Syria. Wasn't till the Versailles peace conference and all that stuff came along that it was split up. One kingdom for the whole area could stand up to Soviet penetration where three or four small states can't possibly. Abdullah's the man to head it up. And that was the key sentence. That's all that Roosevelt needed. Abdullah's the man to head it up. And with that, he had something that he could go and take to the Iraqis because the Jordanian relationship with the Iraqis was always awkward. The Iraqis, because of their oil, had all the money, whereas, uh, as you'll know if you've been to Jordan, it is not a rich country at all. And that picture you saw of Abdullah and the young king, they used to go to Savile Row in London to have their suits made. Well, uh, Abdullah used to go to a tailor on the Salt Road in Amman to have his made up because he had uh, far less money than them. And what Roosevelt did with this information was very clever. He may have used it to confront the British directly to say that uh, the, the, or the American government may have done use that uh, in order to, to say, we know what you're doing. But the thing they were also able to do was to go and see the Iraqis. So the, one of the places that Roosevelt went on this great trip was to Baghdad. And it seems highly likely to me that there he actually gave the Iraqis the evidence of what, uh, not only of what Abdullah was trying to do, which was 
public knowledge because Abdullah was very happy to talk about it, but also the fact that the British were backing him. And he did that to sow discord between, not only between the branches of the Hashemite family, but also between the British and the Iraqis. And it worked very successfully. And that September, in September 1947, the Iraqis made a public statement that they wanted to have nothing to do with Abdullah's plan and the greater Syria plan that Abdullah had come up with fell apart and Tapline then happened. There was, there was no chance of the British exercising uh, too much influence in that part of the world. And over the course of the next couple of years, the, uh, the British and the Americans, uh, the, sorry, the Americans built the Tapline. That then created the second part of this story that, that, that I'll come on to now. Um, that's what I want. So we're back with them and let's just go one further forward, I hope. There we are. Going a bit further south on the map now. Now, so the creation of the tap line offered the prospect of not just of, of enabling the Saudis to export oil to, to Europe, but export more oil because that, that pipeline running over a thousand miles had a huge amount of capacity and they would be able to pump a lot more oil. That was really good news for the Saudis because uh, rather unwisely uh, with hindsight, they, when they first agreed to give the Americans the oil concession in the 1930s, they had agreed, they had tied uh, the money that they got, the royalty that they got to the output. And that really mattered by the late 1940s because by about 1949, uh, the oil price had started to come down. There was basically too much oil on the market. Uh, Britain was in deep trouble and had was forcing uh, people to buy British oil where they could. And what that meant was that Aramco, for perfectly good commercial reasons, cut its output. But the problem for the Saudis was, of course, that that meant that the amount of money that they went, uh, that they got dropped, and it dropped really significantly by something like 25%. So the Saudis getting increasingly worried and they started to look at other ways of putting pressure on Aramco. And the way that they did it was to look at Aramco's oil concession, which broadly uh, covered the east of the country. And they started to talk to Aramco and say, well, you need to start giving up tracts of this. Where you're not, where you're not drilling, you need, to, you need to give it up. And the reason they said that was they just managed to sell a bit up here in what's called the neutral zone. Uh, up, up on the right on the border with Kuwait and Iraq, they just managed to do a much better deal with a different oil company to sell that to them. And that made them realize that they were getting a poor deal from Aramco. Um, but this question of what Aramco should give up raised the question of what actually the oil concession was. Because when uh, King Ibn Saud had granted it in 1933, he simply said, you're entitled to drill for oil within my frontiers. Well, the question was, where were these frontiers? And you can see on this map, even in 1968, when it was published, that the, these are dotted lines. They're dotted lines because the borders have not yet been drawn all down through the south of uh, Arabia. And, uh, and, and the point, the, the problem was that not only had the Saudis offered a concession, but the, uh, the Sultan of Muscat, who was no great friend of uh, Ibn Saud, the Saudi king, had also offered a concession. He'd said, you can drill for oil within my um, kingdom, my sultanate. Uh, and which in that also encountered, it, it, it comprised a sort of an undefined area here. Uh, and the Iraq Petroleum Company, so Aramco's great rival, had, had bought that concession. And they'd also got concessions down uh, the, the coast of what is now the UAE. Uh, so you have a situation where two rival oil companies are trying to work out where they can drill for oil and where the boundaries are in this part of the world. And it is no coincidence that this man, Wilfred Thesiger, uh, decides at this point in time to go exploring in exactly this part of the world. Now, um, Thesiger always afterwards claimed that he hated oil and uh, uh, and thought that the, the effects that it had had on, on the people of South Arabia were, were awful. Um, but I'm afraid to tell you that he was actually working for one of the oil companies, if not both of them. Uh, but this is something that he doesn't say very much about in his book. 
Now, he probably needs very little introduction, but as I was wondering how you might introduce him tonight, I looked in the, the dust jacket of uh, my copy of Arabian Sands, and this stands quite well. Wilfred Thesiger was born in Addis Ababa in 1910 and educated at Eton and Oxford, where he represented the university at boxing. In 1935, he was appointed to the Sudan Political Service and at the outbreak of war joined the Sudan Defence Force. He later served in Abyssinia, Syria, and with the SAS in the Western Desert and was awarded the DSO. Since the war, he has traveled in Southern Arabia, Kurdistan, the marshes of Iraq, the Hindu Kush, the Karakorums, Morocco and Abyssinia. All his journeys, and this is quite important, have been made on foot or with animal transport. And of course, it's that journey in the Hindu Kush that gives that wonderful um, description that Eric Newby has in uh, uh, in a short walk in the Hindu Kush about when he encounters this incredibly craggy, loping fig figure of Thesiger. And if you remember it, at the, uh, the, the punchline is where that night the Thesiger tells them that they must, him and Hugh Carlos, that they must uh, stop and spend the night with him and they kill a few chickens and, and uh, roast them and eat them with rice. And uh, as, as darkness falls, um, uh, Newby and, and Carlos um, uh, decide that it's time to blow up their air beds, at which point, as Newby remembered, Thesiger says, God, you must be a couple of pansies. So this is the man that we're dealing with. And he uh, was bored in uh, Ethiopia in 1945. He had, he had after, after um, or not mentioned in that biography, he had ended up serving as, uh, um, as a political advisor in Ethiopia to the king, Haile Selassie, but he got bored by that. Uh, but then the opportunity of going and working on a locust survey uh, came up and he sees that with both arms, not because he was at all interested in locusts, but because it did get him into this part of the world. But he very rapidly uh, became entangled in the, the oil politics of, 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 of what was going on there. But the locust mission was good because everyone was worried about locusts. And in fact, the, 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 the mission was set up by the British in the war, uh, but it had a Russian director who was called Dr. Uvarov. And uh, he famously used to say that the political difficulties when the locusts copulate are immense because of course the locust swarms could uh, destroy crops in a matter of hours and, and cause famine and, and really, really serious political instability. So the British were very, very interested during the war in understanding more about locusts. And the, the most important thing was that the rulers of the region all agreed with them. So if you were looking for locusts, then you had carte blanche to travel wherever you want. So it was extremely good news uh, for Thesiger. Now, uh, let's just go to the next slide. The beauty of, uh, of getting hold of a first edition of, um, of Thesiger's book is it has this rather wonderful map in the back. And, and uh, I took a photo of it this morning and you're able to, to see it. Um, it's, it. I will try and explain uh, what, it, what is going on in it because all his journeys are marked on here in, in what are actually red lines, but it's not super, super clear, but you get an idea. You can see that there's a, a mass of stuff going on around here and then a couple of big journeys over there, but I'll try and explain it. What Thesiger used to do was essentially he would travel in the winter and then go back to raise funds after his trips, he would go back to the Royal Geographical Society in London and he'd, um, he'd, uh, he'd, he'd basically rattle the tin for some more money and then go back out again. And so his first trip took him just really on the coastal area when he was starting out. And then he tried to cross the desert. So if you remember, this is the Arabian Peninsula you can see here, the coastline uh, running around. And this is the area where the, no one quite knows where the borders are, but matters because people believe that there is oil there. Uh, into this area in 1946-47, heads Thesiger, and he makes this big trip up here uh, before he is turned back at this point here. And the reason he turns back uh, is, he mentions this in the book, but he didn't talk about it at the time because what, what, he, what his guides discovered was that Saudi tax collectors were in the area because what the Saudis did was that they, uh, they, 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 they sent out tax collectors to try to persuade the tribesmen who, who wandered or lived in this part of the world to, to cough up on the basis that if they paid up, uh, that that was an acknowledgement of Saudi sovereignty in this part of the world. Now, the tax collectors enjoyed a pretty frightening reputation and they were run by a man called Ibn Jalui, who uh, was based up here in Hofuf and uh, 
uh, he had a squint, so he pe appeared to be able to look at more than one person at once, which just added to this sort of aura of omniscience that he had. And the, the, the guides that Thesiger took were terrified and said, we've got to get out of here and, uh, and you must not get off your camel because your big footprints will give us away. It will give away the fact that there's been a European here. So staying on their camels, they headed off back down and they went back through the gravelly desert that lies in inner Oman and back to the coast. Now, that was, that was oh, sort of in itself an extraordinary feat, but for Thesiger, it wasn't enough. He wanted to make the full crossing from sea to sea. So he then had another go the following year and uh, he set out from somewhere down here, I think, and then crossed through the sort of the hinterland of, of uh, uh, Hadramaut and then into Saudi, what is now Saudi Arabia. And he took this big wide loop this time uh, and, and went round. And he was stopped by the Saudis. He ended up being sort of put in prison for a couple of days until he was let out by Kim Philby's father. And eventually he was allowed to proceed on his way. And he went back really past the place where he had been forced to turn back before, went up to a place called Baremi and then to the coast. And he'd achieved what he'd set out to do. He'd done this full crossing. Uh, and he had also seen an awful lot of territory. So suddenly he was, um, his knowledge was in demand. And it was in Baremi that this became entirely clear. Now, Baremi matters because it was a, a big oasis. And although people thought there was oil there, there isn't actually, but it was, the mo it was the place that you needed to own if you were going to do any oil exploration in that part of the world. You needed to have a base there because it had copious amounts of water. Uh, but the question was, whose was it? And no one could quite agree on that. Uh, this was very awkward for, particularly for the, for the British company, for the IPC, because they had asked the Sultan of Muscat whether they could go drilling for oil around there, but they'd never, they'd never managed to get permission. He was very reluctant to let them because he knew that his control didn't really extend into this part of the world. And he was worried that someone would get murdered and that the extent of his power would be, um, or the, the limits of his power would be shown. But there was a man there called Richard Bird. He'd managed to get in there anyway, and he worked for the oil company. And he, rather in the fashion that Kim Roosevelt managed to get sort of the, the, the key line out of Kirk Bride earlier in the story, he now managed to get a very important piece of information out of Thesiger uh, in much the same way. He said, uh, and he said, admitted afterwards, this was a complete shot in the dark, but he, had, he asked Thesiger, he said, when you were last in London and you were approached by the American oil company, did you agree to work for them? And, uh, and Thesiger said no, um, but in saying that, he essentially acknowledged that the approach had been made. And this was the interesting thing that up to that point, nobody knew. Nobody knew that when Thesiger went back between that first trip and this second trip uh, to rattle the tin for, for funds, that sometime around that time, someone had come up and tapped him on the shoulder from the American company and said, would you do some work for us? Would you find out what the lie of the land is in this part of the world, where the oil is, and, and, and most importantly, what the allegiances of the peoples are here? And you'll see, if you could see the, the map in close up, you'll see that there are all over here, there are tribes names marked. And, and this was a crucial uh, importance at that time because people wanted to understand who those tribesmen felt was their leader. Anyway, so Thesiger ended up in Baremi uh, and it became clear that he had seen signs of oil. He'd seen oil bubbling to the surface and, uh, uh, and other things that, that were suggestive of oil, other geological um, type formations that, that people at that time, um, before geophys really took off, thought were, might show that there was oil beneath the ground. And so IPC hired him straight away and he became what was called, I think, an, an advance agent for exploring the wilder areas. And so the pattern of Thesiger's travels completely changes. And um, if you imagine, so you saw that he was trying to do these two big trips across the desert. Uh, but then after that, uh, and the, the story that he describes in the remaining uh, part of Arabian Sands, he bases himself at Baremi. And what he does is a series of trips that essentially fan out from Baremi. So they cover all this area. And the reason that he's doing that is twofold. Firstly, he's looking for the signs of oil, this time on behalf of the Iraq Petroleum Company, uh, who think they've got the concession there. But he's also looking for the signs of American geologists, oil geologists looking for oil themselves. So this particular trip out west into what is now 
uh, the bottom of the UAE, was billed as a busted hunting expedition. But that's cover. That was cover for looking for Americans who were being sighted in this part of uh, the desert, looking for the signs of oil, which of course was eventually found in, in that part of the world. So that's a sort of, that's a, 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 a an, hopefully an interesting story about the, the reality of what was going on uh, here in Southern Arabia in the late 1940s. Well, what, how did this all pan out? And I'm going to quickly finish off with the rest of the story before we come on to the questions, I hope. Uh, the thing was, so the, Amer the Aramco was forced to make a, a better deal with the Saudis. The Saudis did their homework very cleverly and discovered that there was a loophole in American tax law that they could use to their advantage. Because the big problem for anyone trying to screw more money out of an oil company was what if it actually reduces the amount of investment that the oil company can make in uh, getting oil out the ground, which obviously we want to happen. And the big fear for the Saudis was that if they asked too much money from them, then Aramco would, would, would essentially not drill for oil, not drill for more oil. Uh, but they then discovered that there was this part of the American tax code that essentially meant that they could, uh, that an American company, which is what Aramco was at that time, could offset any foreign tax against its US tax burden. And at the same time as they did this investigation, they also discovered that not only the, the Americans or the Aramco was actually paying the American government more in tax than it paid to the Saudi monarchy in royalties. So what they needed to do was to change the royalty that they had and turn it into a tax bill. And then the company would be no worse off. The American taxpayer would actually take the hit and, uh, and, and, and they would um, be able to get more money at the same time. And that's exactly what they did. And they did that over the course of 1949 and 1950. Now, why have I told you a, a, a sort of bit of arcane trivia about um, a, a sort of American tax, um, a sort of American tax story? The reason is that it had massive repercussions for the British, and the reason that it did was because immediately once Aramco had made this concession and done what was called the 50-50 deal, where they split the profit even equally with the, the, the Saudis, the British came under huge pressure to agree a similar deal with their host governments. So IPC uh, came under pressure like this in Iraq, but then the big one was Anglo-Iranian, which was the really big oil company, which made Aramco look like a kind of uh, a minnow by comparison. It was producing half as much oil again a day, and it had the exclusive right to draw, drill for oil in, uh, in Iran. And the Americans wanted the British to concede uh, this on Iran because what they wanted to do, they, they, they were worried about Iran turning communist and they felt that, the, that if only the Iranian government had more money at its disposal, that it might be able to sort of improve the standard of living uh, for Iranians uh, as a whole. And so they wanted the British to make this concession, but there was no way the British were going to do this because Anglo-Iranian was set up completely differently. Aramco was a, a shareholder owned company owned by four American oil companies that had shareholders uh, who would see dividends and, and uh, out of the profit that it made. But with Anglo-American, the majority owner uh, and the, with the controlling state was the British government. And the British government regarded Anglo-Iranian as a cash cow that it would milk. And in 1950, uh, when this was a, a big issue, of course, the British government was absolutely short of money. If you read the minutes of the, the, the cabinet meetings at that time, the NHS had just been set up, but two years after its, after its creation, cabinet members are desperately looking at the fact they're going to have to charge people for false teeth and, and, and NHS spectacles. They haven't got enough money uh, in the pot to, to cover this. So the British government is in a really desperate financial position and it's not about to offer the Iranians something better. So when this man, Mohammed Mos Mossadegh, came along in 1949 and, and said, right, you know, we want, we want more, the British government and, and the oil company said no. And at that point, Mossadegh nationalised the oil company, or did so in 1951. And the British had no answer to that. And this is, I think, a, a, a picture taken during the 1951 election campaign. And you can see a rather discomforted looking Herbert Morrison, who was uh, foreign secretary at the time, and complained bitterly about what the Iranians had done, uh, alongside a very 
cheesed off looking Clement Attlee. And of course, the, the Labour government at that time had just spent uh, you know, much of its five years nationalising companies. It wasn't in a very strong position to criticise uh, when, uh, when, when a, a foreign government did the same to it. But the result of that was that, that Anglo-Iranian lost its biggest overseas asset, which was the refinery that it had at the head of the, the Gulf at Abadan. And that churned out three quarters of a million barrels of oil a day and turned them into aviation fuel, but most importantly, turned them into pounds sterling because the big thing about Iranian oil was that it was sold in pounds. So at a time when the British were very, very worried about, about um, uh, their balance of payments and about, about you know, repaying debt, essentially the big reason why Iran was so important was because it, it, created, it created pounds. So that was, that was vital. Uh, but across the other side of the Middle East, uh, another government spotted what was going on. So, of course, the Labour government lost the election in 1951 and the Tories got back in. Uh, but the La Labour had been unable to do anything about what Mossadegh had done. And uh, in Egypt, the Egyptians took note and they immediately launched proceedings to boot the British out of Egypt. And, and the British at that time had a massive base at Suez. Uh, and uh, that was based or that was allowed to them because of a treaty that they had signed in 1936. And the Egyptian parliament, as soon as nationalization had happened in Iran, started the proceedings to cancel the treaty to, to deny the British a legal basis to, to carry on being at Suez. And that is the start of the Suez crisis, which is beyond um, my scope today. I've already talked for, I think, as long as I should. Uh, but that is the point, that is the start of that story. But its origins and the origins of the, the, the fiasco of Suez in 1956, which reveals this the sort of inherent British weakness, lies back here in the 1940s. And in strange stories like this that show jockeying between these two apparent allies for control of that part of the world. And I'll stop there and hand it over to questions. Thank you very much indeed, um, James. And I've got um, a, a question and we already have one um, on the Q&A. So please, uh, um, um, type your questions in now. I'll, it, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. First of all, is this special relationship really special? Um, how would a retired diplomat describe it? And how would you? So I'm talking really about the USA and the UK. Now, the second part of the question is, how has it evolved and changed over time as presidents and prime ministers have changed? So it's really about the special relationship and how it has changed. How would you, or? I think, that yes, that's a really good question. And, ooh, the answer. Um, any, yes, any, any existing diplomat would say that there's a special relationship. And of course, whenever uh, American presidents speak, they're always encouraged to mention it. Uh, and the reason that they're asked to do that is because the special relationship matters not just because of the relationship between Britain and America, which is undoubtedly very close. Uh, it's just not necessarily that we're always on the same page. Uh, but of course, it also matters because of how Britain likes to project itself in the rest of the world. So it, the re, you know, the reason the special relationship is is so important is so that British diplomats can say, do speak to us because we can whisper in the Americans ear because of the special relationship. And I think that's why so much of the, the, the sort of awkward stuff uh, connected to the relationship is still secret long after it should have been declassified of, you know, when, when the 30 year rule um, comes into force. So, so I think that's, you know, that, that's, that's, that's sort of why it is. Is it special? It is undoubtedly special, uh, but it's not the only special relationship. And at times it is distinctly unspecial. So, and I think it's particularly, it's particularly awkward at this time in the forties because there's more parity between these two powers, uh, or at least it, there's, a, there's a feeling, the British feel that they're equals of the Americans, even though the Americans feel that the British are already, you know, in the second division. And Roosevelt himself, Kim Roosevelt, really talks about this and in the book, and he describes an atmosphere where the British and the Americans are constantly in tension and, and, um, 
and admits in one at one point in you know in print in 1949 that the, in that part of the world the British and the Americans get on in fact rather badly uh, to sort of try and um, sort of clear up the sort of the illusion if you like so it wasn't a very helpful book even at uh, that time even though no one would have realized quite why it was so interesting uh, so I think it was a you know it was particularly difficult and tense really at that at that time it has probably become easier now that Britain is more uh, you know acknowledges that it is the junior partner in the in 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 the in the coalition uh, and that has made things that has made things easier. And I suppose that kind of answers to the second, the point about the evolution that it, it, it probably, it has become more straightforward because of, because of that sort of working out of the, the pecking order, I think. Right. Well, shall we bring it up to date in that case? And how do you see that special relationship unfolding under Biden's presidency? That's a good question. I mean, Biden, Biden himself mentioned it the other day, uh, uh, and no doubt there would have been plenty of relief here that that you know that that had been that box had been ticked. Of course, he feels like he's got to sort of mend fences after four years where the going has been very very rocky. Regardless of what you think about Trump, um, you know, and what he's done, the fact is it's just been very hard to predict what's happened, and there's no question that it's it's been a very difficult relationship. Uh, because of the sort of the uncertainty of it, uh, and Biden is trying to to mend fences, and and he, he need he needs allies everywhere else. I think the big question is really how much you know how much Britain can do and wants to do, and and of course this has been the problem uh, on both sides of the Atlantic for for years now. We felt it perhaps first in the sense that you know Britain voted against getting involved in Syria because of being kind of burnt in Iraq, uh, um, if you like. Uh, and the, the Americans at the time, you know, regarded that as being a bit of a letdown. On the other hand, Barack Obama essentially uh, managed to get elected by portraying himself as not Hillary Clinton and, and not someone who wished to get hugely engaged in the Middle East. Uh, and if you look at Biden's or the Democrats, rather, their big statement, the, the big policy platform that they put out before the election, it's 91 pages long, and the Middle East itself only appears on page 90. So you get the sense reading that, that it perhaps it's sort of rather wishful thinking. They don't particularly wish this to dominate uh, Joe Biden's presidency either. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, it's it's a bit hard to say, you know, what the, the overall relationship will look like. And clearly, there's a kind of there's a tension between having a conservative government and a and a, and a, a democratic uh, presidency uh, uh, over there, but we'll we'll see. But I don't sort of detect great, you know. There, there's not going to be. I well, I I personally see it, find it hard to see there being a great sort of coalition of interests in the same way that there was, say, in two thousand and three. I think uh, the experience of that is still pretty raw, uh, and there's lots of you know reasons for Britain not to get involved. Thank you, James. I, I now want to change the, the, the kind of question. As a, an academic and a fellow researcher, I just want, want to ask you a, a process question. You have done an inordinate amount of research, and anyone who has looked at your book um, will be able to see um, you know, the astonishing doc and number of documents that you have consulted. What were the most interesting or surprising finds? Um, I think there's there's three things I'd mention. One is that the, the Americans have declassified uh, documents relating to Iran because they have admitted their role in the 1953 coup. Uh, they have felt able to release more documents. So there's stuff in there which helps explain what was going on with the British. So one of the things that that Herbert Morrison thought about doing and the British seriously considered was trying to overthrow the Iranian government in 1951 and possibly trying to divide the, the country. They, they looked into creating a revolt by the very powerful tribes that are in the south of the country and the Americans warned them off it and, and the revelation of that, that was what the British were up to is contained in these American documents. So that fills in a very interesting bit of the puzzle that I suspected but didn't have any evidence for. Uh, the second thing is uh, those cabinet secretary minutes that I mentioned during the talk. 
uh, if you've ever taken a set of minutes, you'll know that your job is to make, usually make them as bland as possible and to sort of make arguments, um, you know, to sort of to, 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 to downplay matters of, uh, of disagreement and so on. Uh, but the cabinet secretary, I don't know if it's still the case, but they used to keep a, a verbatim, or a, I say they would actually keep a note during the meeting that the minutes would be based on. But but in those in those notebooks, you get much more sort of snatches of conversation and you get a much better idea of the kind of the interplay and what people might have said, because there's definitely, you know, there's, there's phrases there. And so I used a good number of, I mean, I, I read them very carefully for um, for the book and, and used as much as possible of it where I felt that it seemed to be a, a good, you know, a good record of what was actually said in the meeting. So you find, for example, one of the sort of interesting things, uh, thinking about sort of the current situation, Brexit and the whole question of the sort of international rule of law. But in the 50s, when the Conservatives got back in and, and Churchill was very much in his uh, uh, in decline, frankly, there's a fascinating meeting where he they're talking about whether they can uh, or how long they can lock up Egyptian uh, insurgents that they capture. So by that point, the British were under siege on the canal and they were being attacked all the time by um, guerrillas. And uh, Churchill says, oh, he, the phrase he uses is pig it. Don't don't worry too much about the law because somebody else in the room, possibly Eden, had said, you know, it's illegal. We can't just imprison these people without trial, um, you know, forever. And and Churchill's caught on the not necessarily on the record. I suppose it is on the record, but saying, oh, don't worry too much about that. You know, we'll 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 get by. So that's very interesting, and it gives you kind of a, a you know at times a rather bare insight into. Uh, you know, the realities of, of, of what goes on in the cabinet room. The final thing I, I found, which I, I was able to use loads of in the diary, but I couldn't quite sort of bring to the front, was the diary of a man called John Slade Baker, who's a very interesting, um, but completely unknown character. He uh, had worked as a, um, he'd, he'd been in the British Army in Egypt during the war, and then afterwards he joined the Sunday Times as a special correspondent, and he kept a diary, a most extraordinary diary, which runs to 3,000 odd pages and is now in uh, St Anthony's College in, in Oxford, where anyone can go and read it. And it's been, it's been there for 50 years, but I must have been, I think, the first person to really go into it because if you actually read it you discover that he was also working for MI6 the British intelligence service at the same time and so you get this uh, it's a very very interesting diary as a result of that because you can see what the kind of information he was being asked to find out um, but there's also a lot of quite indiscreet stuff about what Britain was doing on a you know intelligence operations because uh, he talks quite a lot about it so the problem is that he himself is not that important a character, although undoubtedly the kind of information he was producing was influencing uh, British sort of political decision making back in London. So I couldn't actually write him into the story, but if you look in the footnotes, you'll find that this diary is everywhere because it's a very good source and I was able to corroborate it against other sources as well. So I was confident that it's a, you know, it's a pretty good um, and reliable um, yeah, source to use. Great, thank you. Actually, we now have quite a few questions. But first of all, I'd like to say uh, Patricio Klaus um, is saying hi from Argentina. And nice to see you, James. Good morning. Hello. Or maybe um, an afternoon, actually. It's not so the time zone's not so far behind, is it? No. Um, Nathan Watson um, sends um, a very interesting question. Ennis Bevin is viewed by many as the last great British foreign secretary. Given your knowledge of his foreign policy in the Middle East, how do you view his, how do you view his performance as foreign secretary? And what were his main successes and failures? Mm, that's an excellent question. Um, and it's, a, it's an awkward one. It's an awkward one. Uh, so, I mean, the thing is that, I mean, he was, he was essentially very, very anti-Semitic. And this, uh, I'm not sure even I bring it out as much as I, I think I now realize in the book. 
Uh, but he let's I mean let's let's start on the, the kind of the, the sort of the positive side. I mean he is no question he was very highly regarded. He'd been a you know linchpin of Britain's war effort, uh, was hugely popular. Uh, he, and in fact, he was one of the people that Wendell Wilkie met. When, Wendell Wilkie came through Britain in the Blitz in 1941, and, and Bevin was one of the people that he met because Bevin was absolutely key to the war effort. And there's no doubt that he was admired in the Foreign Office. Um, the trouble is, I think that history is going to be uh, much less kind to him. But what he did do is he he did understand the need to sort of try and sort of pick Britain up and dust it, dust it off and, and, and have a, um, essentially have some sort of some, some almost breathing space and, 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 tr and try to sort of, you know, f f find some time and, and then come back. And, and that is partly why the British were back supporting King Abdullah in Jordan in, in, in the, by the late 40s, that they, they were looking for a way back in. They had been thwarted by the Americans during the war by, by this chap, James Landis, but then they were, then they were coming back. The difficulty was uh, that on Palestine, which was one of the, the big, big issues and, and, and you know, a, uh, just a, a failure for Bevin, that he was very, very tin-eared, that he didn't understand um, how this was, how the whole question was viewed outside the UK. And, I, you know, he said, I, in his view, uh, there were lots and lots of people who had been uh, left homeless by the war, you know, and much worse than that. And everybody had to form an orderly queue and, and, and you know, their, their problems would be sorted out just as quick as everybody could. Um, but the problem was that when you were talking about um, Jewish displaced people who'd escaped the Holocaust, uh, who, you know, were either leaving, had been living in hiding in, in Europe or had escaped, this sounded pretty bad. And... And so that didn't, you know, it didn't buy the British, I just got to move the Q&A slightly, um, that didn't buy the British, you know, didn't buy the British any credit uh, with the rest of the world, and particularly not with the Americans. And I talk about this um, at, at great length in the book, but about the, 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 the problems that Britain had with Palestine and with, with essentially trying to hang on to it. I mean, the it was only very, very late in, in 1947 that they essentially decided that they, they could no longer hang in there. But throughout the period before that, Bevin and others were looking for ways to try and keep themselves in, uh, keep Britain, keep that as, as Britain's main base. In fact, the problem initially was with the Egyptians, that, that uh, the relations with the Egyptians had soured because of the British presence there during the Second World War. And so actually, initially, Bevin thought that, that Palestine would be the, the, the place that Britain would be able to base uh, itself out of after the war. And of course, that showed really no understanding of the reality, because by 1944, 45, there was essentially an insurgency going on there. And that only grew in, in power after the war. So let me see, I actually need to answer the question. But I mean, I think so. I think his, his great success was 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 trying to sort of you know buy buy Britain time get get uh get Britain back then there's the, the whole question of course of things like NATO which was very very important uh he of course then became ill and and died perhaps you know he, he could have gone on and, and achieved more uh, but I think that Palestine is the big big failure because uh he didn't manage there partly because of because of the tone of how he approached the problem but he didn't manage to find um outside support whether he could have done that, perhaps it perhaps it was an impossible task. But the way in which he went about it didn't make it any easier for Britain. Thank you. Um, before I go into the next question, I just wanted to tell everyone um, that this um, uh, talk is recorded because someone apologised that they um, joined late because he had problems um, in in connecting. It will be. It is being recorded. And it will be available on the Rosal website within the next day or so. So if you missed any of it or you want to revisit, don't worry about it because you, you can do that. Our next question is, with the UAE in particular seeking to build a dominant position in the Gulf, in the light of the legacy described in your book, how would you advise the British government to frame their foreign policy towards the region? And what might we expect in the forthcoming UK foreign policy and defense review? Quite, 
quite a, a, a substantial question here. That is a serious question, and I'm not I'm not actually very well uh, qualified to answer it. I think. I mean, I think so. Just um, what might we expect in the fo the forthcoming foreign policy and defence review? I I don't I don't know, uh, but I think it's my big concern is. Uh, listening to what I've sort of from what I've seen so far is the question of how much money we have to spend and what our ambitions are because there seems to be a bit of a mismatch between those two things given where we are and the, the debt that we're piling up I think we we um, we have to uh, you know cut our cloth accordingly so uh, I think um, you know I think we we have to sort of be be limited in what we're trying to do but at the same time of course in a world where there are lots and lots of threats and, and, and opportunities as well um, to extend our influence. It's, I mean, it's tricky. I, particularly with the, the UAE, uh, I mean, my feeling is, uh, with all these things, is it depends really on what, what our foreign policy seeks to achieve. Uh, you know, what is it that we are trying to spread around, uh, around the you know the the world and what values are we um pursuing if 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 we are trying to pursue values and not just sort of straight uh interests uh, although those two things could be tied together and so i kind of look at the uae uh in fact i look at all these states and i'm sure in the way that british diplomats do and say well this is you know this is potentially it's quite awkward um the, a lot of these states have got uh um policies that we don't agree with uh and and therefore a very open partnership with them isn't always an easy thing to to achieve um that said i mean the, the point you can see already that we have been investing a lot in 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 building a presence in 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 the gulf area uh with oman obviously is the kind of the oman is the the, the the um the country that we have stayed most closely involved with i mean ironically of course we had a treaty with the Sultan back in 1799 against the French, and uh, and that has you know that that relationship carries on. Um, but the question in the Gulf, I think, is com is more complicated because of because of that. But I don't know. Perhaps it's made easier by uh, the fact that there's Iran threatening a lot of these countries, uh, or you know, perceived as a threat, and that therefore, yeah, assuming that we also regard Iran as a threat, which I think we do. Uh, that the, you know, there's there's places for for interest where our interests absolutely align, but just a question of exactly how open we wish to be about it, and and uh, and, and whether we you know whether we are willing to to also say some slightly awkward things about uh, how these countries treat people and um, their attitude to human rights and things like that, which uh, which of course you know we do need to um, be open or we do we do something that we do need to pursue because there's a greater question about what china does and, and that i think is the big question over the you know the next 20 years is going to be you know how we position ourselves relative to to china and what we're trying to what you know what um unique selling points if you like we're trying to to uh, advance and 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 you know with china clearly issues of freedom is is a big one Thank you. In fact, we had quite a significant um, um, panel discussion on China last week. Oh. And anyone who missed it, it is now on, on the website. Um, so, um, yes, do look at it. Um, a very quick one. By the way, we, we are due to finish by quarter past um, seven, so we don't have very much longer. Um, so, a couple more questions. A quick one. What is your next book going to be about? So it's called The Arena, and it's going to take uh, take the story backwards uh, and forwards. Um, one of the things that I have realised doing the research for both this last book and the book before is that uh, they kind of uncover. They are not. They don't explain everything that has happened in the Middle East, and that. In some ways, you have to go back a lot further in time to to explain that. So this next book will start. Uh, it's going to cover a huge sweep of history, basically about three thousand years, and it will go right back to um, to the fall of Nineveh. I think that's where I'm going to start, and come as I'm not quite sure right up to the present day, but it it will and it will essentially ask the question about why 
uh, why people fight over the Middle East. Now, you know, that's not that's not the, the problem with this is the danger is that it is not the case that people are always fighting over the Middle East, but it is it is significant that, you know, over 3000 years, it has been a zone for conflict and particularly for outsiders. That's what I'm particularly interested in. I'm I'm less interested in the more local uh, disputes, say like the Iran-Iraq war, or, although that that will be part of the book. But I'm very interested about why people like the Mongols or the Romans or the Greeks or the well Macedonians, I suppose more, uh, have come there and why they end up coming to blows with someone else in that part of the world. So the book will try to explain that. So it will try, in a sense, uh, to explain why, or one of the things it will explain for me, I think, is why the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which a lot of people think is responsible for the, the political settlement of the, the region and why the borders look the way they are. But I think the more I think about that agreement, the more I see it as a sort of symptom of something deeper, which is that at the turn of the 20th century, Britain and France were the two great powers in, in, uh, in that part of the world. And so they cut a deal. In fact, they didn't fight over it, but they cut a deal to divide the Middle East between them. But that is a symptom of something that's been going on for much longer. So, I mean, in, in itself, that rivalry had been going on in, for about a century. But, you know, if you go back further, you can see the Romans clashing with the Parthians or, uh, you know, the Mamluks and the Mongols, for example. So it's not always Western and, you know, identifiably a, a, a Western power or, uh, um, or a, you know, a, a, an Eastern power. But there are groups of people from, and I'm going to define the Middle East. I really, I'm thinking about the Fertile Crescent when I say this. So I'm, I'm defining it quite narrowly. Uh, so that the Mamluks, for example, would be a, a not so much an outsider, but anyway, they, that would be part of the story. So that's the aim. Um, and I've got about two more years to, to do the job. Right. So when you when it is published, please let us know. Yeah. Because <laughs> there are quite a few people that are interested. Um, we it's only two minutes uh, before we need to finish. So I'm afraid I cannot take the um, last two questions. Um, because there are a couple of things I want to tell everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you very much, James. Um, I think I, this was absolutely fascinating, informative and enlightening talk. Um, you've, uh, in, even though I've read the book, um, you still brought everything to life um, for us. And thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, now, to everyone else, this is the last Evelyn Wrench talk this year, but next year we have three wonderful Evelyn Wrench lectures for you. So please look out for them and make a note of the dates. Very briefly, uh, 18th of March at the club. Uh, now we've already discussed China. Our next uh, one is gonna be Russia. Look Harding on Russia who um, published Shadow State on Russia. On the 28th of April, that's gonna be a Zoom meeting um, on the ultralight rail, the new industry. Now we have the chairman of the all party parliamentary group for light rail, Andrew Carter MP, uh, several other members on the panel, including Baroness Veer, the Under Secretary of State, Department of Transport. So really the big guns for this particular panel. And then on the, in, on the 3rd of June, and this will be again back at the club, we have these three amazing women. The title is Inspirational Black Women in Publishing, Music and Fashion. So on publishing, we have Valerie Branders on music, um, Chichi Noku, and on fashion, Maggie Semple. Um, so look out for those as they're coming um, along for next year, and I hope you can join us. And finally, I'd like to say that due to the coronavirus and the associated restrictions, as you know, Rosal is facing unprecedented financial challenges. As a not-for-profit organization, they currently need help with their operational costs and are therefore asking members to support their Rosal for the Future campaign. Your generous support will help to keep Rosal thriving in these trying times. So please go to www.rosal.org.uk 
stroke supporters. And there will be um, a slide up um, to show you the, um, the, the, webs the link. And finally, I know that there are a number of non-members who have joined us for today's event. You are, of course, very welcome. And if you would like to know more about how to join Rosal, please email membership at rosal.org.uk. Thank you very, very much, um, James, and everyone who took part and for your questions. And the last two questions I will send to James by email. And if you send me your emails, I will, um, I have Gillian's email, but not the, the, the other member. Um, then he, uh, James may wish to, to, to answer them by, by email. So thank you all very, very much indeed. Um, and everyone else who makes these um, Zoom meetings possible. Thank you everyone and see you next year and have a wonderful break um, for Christmas and New Year. Bye everyone. Thank you, bye.